from the first epistle of St. Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. In verse 7, it says, Spudge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. He says, Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. He calls Christ our Passover. What do you mean by Passover? What, what, what's that expression? For you to understand that, I'd like to turn to the book of Exodus, chapter 12. And we'll begin reading from verse 1. And I want you to try to understand this. The children of Israel had been in bondage in Egypt. And God wanted to bring them out. And we remember one sign after the another. Moses performed miracles before Pharaoh, demanding that he let the people go. And the Bible tells us that Pharaoh hadn't his heart and would not let the people go until God said, now I'm going to perform one more sign. And he told Moses what to do. Now I want to begin reading from verse 1, chapter 12, book of Exodus. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. He shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And he shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take off the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night roast with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it eat not of it raw nor sudden at all with water but roast with fire his head with his legs and with partners thereof and he shall let nothing of it remain until the morning and that which remaineth of it until the morning he shall burn with fire and thus shall ye eat it with your loins gathered your shoes on your feet and your staff in your hand and he shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. He says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the blood means that something had died. A lamb had been slain, and the blood of the lamb was rubbed on the doorpost, the two side posts of the door of the house, and on the upper post, on the lintel of the house. And God said, when I see the blood, the death angel, the destroyer, will not come in to destroy and he'll pass over you. That's where he got the term Passover. And he said, it is the Lord's Passover. So that lamb that was slain that night 
was the uh, symbol of the Passover. It was called the Passover lamb. And the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7 that Christ is our Passover. Christ has been slain for us. And his blood was used for that symbol, for that sign of his death. And you know, it means that judgment passed over because he was judged in our place like that lamb back in the Old Testament was slain for the Hebrew, for the Jew. That lamb was slain in his place. And so God passed over because death was coming to town. And the firstborn of every household was going to die. He says, both of man and beast. But now, because God had shown them what to do, the dead angel would not come in to destroy in their houses. But the Egyptians didn't have the blood. And so the dead angel killed from the house of Pharaoh to the house of the slave or the born man in the dungeon. And they suffered a terrible catastrophe. Christ is our Passover. And I want to read again to you from 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. And with this in mind, that Christ is our Passover, I want you to follow this. From verse 23, chapter 11, 1 Corinthians. For I have received of the Lord that which also I deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take it, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. On that night, Jesus let the disciples know that this bread that he was breaking was his body. The Bible says he took bread. He gave thanks and break it and said, take, eat, this is my body. You see, it reminds you of the Passover lamb that was eaten. You see, now the body is broken and it says, eat it. Christ is our Passover. They ate the lamb. The Bible tells us that God asked the children of Israel to eat the lamb. And you see, here he says, and when he had given thanks, verse 24, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. It's in his blood. Praise God. It's in his blood. Our salvation came from his blood. Our salvation came from there. That's why it was possible for us to be born again. See, the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, is a new creation in Christ. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. What changed because of that? We're born again because of that. Because we came into Christ. Christ, our Passover, had been sacrificed for us. And in that Christ... We are given a new life because he died, and the Bible says died unto sin once, and now he lives unto God. And so we also reckon ourselves to be alive to God with a new kind of life. There's no destruction for the child of God. Do you remember the children of Israel? God said, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. He said, the destroyer shall not come to your house. The destroyer shall not come to your house. It doesn't matter in what way the destroyer tried to destroy. Whether it comes to destroy with poverty or sickness, disease or infirmity of any kind, he will not come into your house. The reason is Christ, our Passover, has sacrificed for us. And we carry that Christ in our spirits. We carry that life in our spirits. The Bible says that we have passed from death unto life. We have passed over. We have crossed over. We have come into the place of the new life. The children of Israel were on their way to the promised land. And that's why they needed this. And you remember, God said to them, when you eat the lamb, when you eat it, he said, eat it with your shoes on your feet, with your staff in your hand. That means you're going somewhere. And so this is what has happened with us. We have crossed over 
in Christ Jesus. We have passed from death unto life. And we are in that promised land. We have arrived in our place in Christ Jesus. And it's a land that flows with milk and honey. You know, there are a lot of people who say Christianity is not a bed of roses, but it is. The reason they say it's not is because of their own experience. But it's a land that flows with milk and honey. The truth is, the land that flows with milk and honey has got giants. You see, and that's not a problem. That's not a problem. That's a bed of roses means it's a, a land that flows with milk and honey. There's a lot of good in the land, in spite of the fact that there are giants. But like Caleb said, he said, give me this mountain. And if the Lord be with me, I'll drive out the giants. And that's what we're doing in our fight of faith. We drive out every giant by the power of the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Thanks be unto God for the New Testament. The testament by which we live. It is this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Praise the Lord. And this is just wonderful. Thank God for the blood of Christ. The Bible says it speaks better things than the blood of Abel. Crying for salvation rather than vengeance. No wonder he says the law came by Moses, grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. He brought grace and truth. See, we are the result of this testament. And it is an amazing grace. Hallelujah. And I say this to you. You know, he never told us to take a, a drink of water for anything, even though we might do it, if we are led by the Spirit to do that at any time. He never told us to swallow anything, even though we might do it, if we're particularly led by the Spirit to do that. He never told us to rob anything, even though we might do it if we're particularly led by the Spirit. But one thing he told us to drink is this one. He told us to drink this cup in commemoration of his shed blood. And when you do it, nothing of the devil can remain in your body. It's greater than every drug that you might drink, greater than any syrup that you might drink. If you take this drink, which is in the communion of the blood of Christ, no sickness can remain in your body. No infirmity can remain in your body. Remember, when we do this, it does show the Lord's death. It confirms it. It preaches it. It announces it. This is what he asks us to do. Doesn't matter what your condition is, a miracle will happen inside you. A miracle will happen in your life. Doesn't matter that you've been suffering with diabetes. Doesn't matter that you've had symptoms of cancer. It'll end today. The anointing of God will come on you. Now, I want to read something to you from the Bible. You know, it pays to have direction from God. You know, the problem with most people in the world today is a lack of direction. They have no direction for their lives. They just keep doing things. They just keep moving without a direction. Would you turn to the book of James, chapter 5, and verse number 16. All right, now it says, Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that she may be healed. Now that doesn't mean I call somebody and say, I want to confess my faults to you. That's not what he's talking about. He says to own up. If you've done something wrong against another person, own up and say, this is what I did. I'm sorry. Okay? So, and then he says, pray one for another. So he says, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that he may be healed. See, it's the same thing. So accept your faults. That's what it's telling you. If, you. if you've wronged someone else, accept the fault. Don't defend it. But then pray for one another. 
But that's not the part I want to show you. It's the latter part, the second part of it I want to show you. It says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And so, in the context of praying for others, is where he brings this in to let us know how we can be effective in changing other people's lives. You know, there's somebody in the church who's not doing fine, who's given up the faith, intercede for that one, pray for that one. You will make an impact. You will restore that life. You see, we can do a lot. The people around us who are not growing very well in Christ, we can intercede for them. We can change their lives. So, um, you can see that they say, the effect of her prayer of a righteous man availed much. Now I'll read it to you from the Amplified Translation. And remember, Amplified doesn't mean saying something that wasn't there or adding something that was not supposed to be there. Amplified just means making it louder, making it clearer so you can hear it. That's exactly what we got in this translation. I won't read it to you. It says, Confess to one another, therefore, your faults, your sleeps, your false steps, your offenses, your sins. Not sins against God, sins against them. All right? Because they are the ones to forgive you when you sin against them. God forgives you when you sin against God. All right. Then it says, And pray also for one another that you may be healed and restored to a spiritual tone of mind and heart. Now, listen to this second part of it. It says, The earnest, heartfelt, heartfelt. When you intercede like this, it's heartfelt. That means your emotion is brought together with it in your prayer. So it says, The innocent had failed prayer of a righteous man. Who's a righteous man? A righteous man is the one who's coming to Christ. A righteous man is the one who has received the salvation of Christ. The new creation in Christ Jesus has been declared righteous. The Bible says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we are at peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Being justified means being declared righteous by faith. So it says here, the earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available. Oh, wow. The earnest prayer. The heartfelt, continued prayer. That means you don't just pray two minutes and go away. No, you press. You press in your prayer. You press in your prayer. And you take a hold of it with your heart. He says that kind of prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available. Why do many people pray and things are not happening? Because the power is not made available. Why are many people wanting changes that are not taking place? Because they are not making power available for the change. Is there power available for the change? The change that you want in your family, the change that you want in your finances, the change that you want in your job, the change you want in your life, is there power made available for it? There's got to be power for the change. You've got to make power available for the change. And God shows us how to make it happen. How to make power available for change. So, I read it on. He says, The earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its working. Oh boy, he says, that power produces results. It is dynamic in producing results. That's what he's saying. We will make power available. That's what we're going to do. We're going to pray in tongues especially. It's so important. See, let me tell you something. Don't argue. Don't join those who are arguing about, is it right for most everyone speaking in tongues? The only people who are contesting everybody speaking in tongues are those who don't speak in tongues. Only those who don't speak in tongues keep saying it's not everybody that has to speak in tongues. If you do, you want everybody to do that. Now, I just read to you where it says, the heartfelt, continued prayer, the earnest prayer of a righteous man avails much. It says it makes power available, tremendous power available. We're going to make power available for the change. There's some of you who wanted certain things to change and you didn't see the result. You prayed, you confessed, you wanted something to change. You didn't see the result. You can make something happen by making power available for the change. Now when that power is made available through prayer, then you give the word and it shall come to pass. 
You see, until the power is made available, you may give the word and something may not happen. See, it's not everything that when you make a confession, it just changes. No, some require power for the change. And those things that require that power for change are the ones I'm telling you now. You can make a difference if you will pray this way and you will begin today. You begin today. You pray in tongues. And I tell you, every now and then when you're alone, when you have the time alone, just speak in tongues, pray in tongues, pray in the Spirit. As you pray in the Spirit, it will come from your spirit, from your innermost being. You will make power available. You're going to make power available every now and then. Everywhere you are privately, you come to yourself and you pray in tongues. You pray in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. Make power available unfailingly. And nothing will stand in your way. Nothing will destroy that which you have planted. Nothing will change the course of your life in which you're supposed to be going. If you will pray the way I'm telling you now, success will be your testimony. Victory will be your testimony. And nothing can change that. So get ready for the change. Get ready for it. You are going to make power available. Available for the change. Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Everything. 